The Feast of Lanterns. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ruth Golding. The Feast of Lanterns from Books for the Bairns. Edited by W. T. Stead. Wang Chi watches a game of chess. Wang Chi was only a poor man, but he had a wife and children to love, and they made him so happy that he would not have changed places with the emperor himself. He worked in the fields all day, and at night his wife always had a bowl of rice ready for his supper, and sometimes, for a treat, she made him some bean soup, or gave him a little dish of fried pork. But they could not afford pork very often, he generally had to be content with rice. One morning, as he was setting off to his work, his wife sent Han Chung, his son, running after him, to ask him to bring home some firewood. "'I shall have to go up into the mountain for it at noon,' he said. "'Go and bring me my axe, Han Chung.' Han Chung ran for his father's axe, and Ho Sin Ko, his little sister, came out of the cottage with him. "'Remember it is the Feast of Lanterns to-night, father,' she said. "'Don't fall asleep up on the mountain. We want you to come back and light them for us.' She had a lantern in the shape of a fish, painted red and black and yellow, and Han Chung had got a big round one, all bright crimson, to carry in the procession. And besides that there were two large lanterns to be hung outside the cottage door, as soon as it grew dark. Wang Chi was not likely to forget the Feast of Lanterns, for the children had talked of nothing else for a month, and he promised to come home as early as he could. At noontide, when his fellow labourers gave up working and sat down to rest and eat, Wang Chi took his axe and went up the mountain slope to find a small tree that he might cut down for fuel. He walked a long way, and at last saw one growing at the mouth of a cave. "'This will be just the thing,' he said to himself. But before striking the first blow, he peeped into the cave to see if it were empty. To his surprise, two old men with long white beards were sitting inside playing chess, as quietly as mice, with their eyes fixed on the chessboard. Wang Chi knew something of chess, and he stepped in and watched them for a few minutes. As soon as they look up, I can ask them if I may chop down a tree, he said to himself. But they did not look up, and by and by Wang Chi got so interested in the game that he put down his axe and sat on the floor to watch it better. The two old men sat cross-legged on the ground, and the chessboard rested on a slab, like a stone table, between them. On one corner of the slab lay a heap of small brown objects which Wang Chi took at first to be date-stones. But after a time the chess-players ate one each, and put one in Wang Chi's mouth, and he found it was not a date-stone at all. It was a delicious kind of sweetmeat, the like of which he had never tasted before, and the strangest thing about it was that it took his hunger and thirst away. He had been both hungry and thirsty when he came into the cave, as he had not waited to have his midday meal with the other field workers, but now he felt quite comforted and refreshed. He sat there some time longer, and noticed, as the old men frowned over the chessboard, their beards grew longer and longer, until they swept the floor of the cave, and even found their way out of the door. "'I hope my beard will never grow as quickly,' said Wang Chi as he rose and took up his axe again. Then one of the old men spoke for the first time. "'Our beards have not grown quickly, young man. How long is it since you came here?' "'About half an hour, I dare say,' replied Wang Chi. But as he spoke, the axe crumbled to dust beneath his fingers, and the second chess-player laughed and pointed to the little brown sweetmeats on the table. Half an hour, or half a century, ay, half a thousand years, are alike to him who tastes of these. Go down into your village, 
and see what has happened since you left it. The sad consequences. So Wang Chi went down as quickly as he could from the mountain, and found the fields where he had worked covered with houses, and a busy town where his own little village had been. In vain he looked for his house, his wife, and his children. There were strange faces everywhere, and although when evening came the Feast of Lanterns was being held once more, there was no Ho Sin Ko carrying her red and yellow fish, or Han Chung with his flaming red ball. At last he found a woman, a very, very old woman, who told him that when she was a tiny girl she remembered her grandmother saying how, when she was a tiny girl, a poor young man had been spirited away by the genie of the mountains on the day of the Feast of Lanterns, leaving his wife and little children with only a few handfuls of rice in the house. Moreover, if you wait while the procession passes, you will see two children, dressed to represent Han Chung and Ho Sin Ko, and their mother carrying the empty rice bowl between them, for this is done every year, to remind people to take care of the widow and fatherless, she said. So Wang Chi waited in the street, and in a little while the procession came to an end, and the last three figures in it were a boy and girl dressed like his own two children, walking on either side of a young woman carrying a rice bowl. But she was not like his wife in anything but her dress, and the children were not at all like Han Chung and Ho Sin Ko and poor Wang Chi's heart was very heavy as he walked away out of the town. He slept out on the mountain, and early in the morning found his way back to the cave where the two old men were playing chess. At first they said they could do nothing for him, and told him to go away and not disturb them. But Wang Chi would not go, and they soon found the only way to get rid of him was to give him some really good advice. You must go to the white hair of the moon, and ask him for a bottle of the elixir of life. If you drink that, you will live for ever, said one of them. But I don't want to live for ever, objected Wang Chi. I wish to go back and live in the days when my wife and children were here. Ah, well, for that you must mix the elixir of life with some water out of the sky dragon's mouth. And where is the sky dragon to be found? inquired Wang Chi. "'In the sky, of course. You really ask very stupid questions. He lives in a cloud cave, and when he comes out of it he breathes fire, and sometimes water. If he is breathing fire you will be burnt up, but if it is only water you will easily be able to catch some in a bottle. What else do you want?' For Wang Chi still lingered at the mouth of the cave. "'I want a pair of wings to fly with and a bottle to catch the water in,' he replied boldly. So they gave him a little bottle, and before he had time to say thank you, a white crane came sailing past and lighted on the ground close to the cave. "'The crane will take you wherever you like,' said the old men. "'Go now, and leave us in peace.' Wang Chi visits the fire dragon. Wang Chi sat on the white crane's back, and was taken up and up and up through the sky to the cloud cave where the sky dragon lived. And the dragon had the head of a camel, the horns of a deer, the eyes of a rabbit, the ears of a cow, and the claws of a hawk. Besides this he had whiskers and a beard, and in his beard was a bright pearl. All these things show that he was a real, genuine dragon, and if you ever meet a dragon who is not exactly like this, you will know he is only a make-believe one. Wang Chi felt rather frightened when he perceived the cave in the distance, and if it had not been for the thought of seeing his wife again, and his little boy and girl, he would have been glad to turn back. While he was far away, the cloud cave looked like a dark hole in the midst of a soft, white, woolly mass, such as one sees in the sky on an April day. But as he came nearer, he found the cloud was as hard as a rock, 
and covered with a kind of dry white grass. When he got there, he sat down on a tuft of grass near the cave, and considered what he should do next. The first thing was, of course, to bring the dragon out, and the next to make him breathe water instead of fire. "'I have it!' cried Wang Chi at last, and he nodded his head so many times that the white crane expected to see it fall off. He struck a light and set the grass on fire, and it was so dry that the flames spread all around the entrance to the cave, and made such a smoke and crackling that the sky dragon put his head out to see what was the matter. "'Ho, ho!' cried the dragon, when he saw what Wang Chi had done. "'I can soon put this to rights!' And he breathed once, and the water came from his nose and mouth in three streams. But this was not enough to put the fire out. Then he breathed twice, and the water came out in three mighty rivers, and Wang Chi, who had taken care to fill his bottle when the first stream began to flow, sailed away on the white crane's back as fast as he could to escape being drowned. The rivers poured over the cloud rock until there was not a spark left alight, and rushed down through the sky into the sea below. Fortunately, the sea lay right underneath the dragon's cave, or he would have done great mischief. As it was, the people on the coast looked out across the water toward Japan, and saw three inky black clouds stretching from the sky into the sea. "'My word, there is a fine rainstorm out at sea,' they said to each other. But, of course, it was nothing of the kind. It was only the sky dragon putting out the fire Wang Chi had kindled. Wang Chi visits the white hair of the moon. Meanwhile, Wang Chi was on his way to the moon, and when he got there he went straight to the hut where the hare of the moon lived, and knocked at the door. The hare was busy pounding the drugs which make up the elixir of life, but he left his work and opened the door, and invited Wang Chi to come in. He was not ugly like the dragon. His fur was quite white and soft and glossy, and he had lovely gentle brown eyes. The hare of the moon lives a thousand years, as you know, and when he is five hundred years old he changes his colour from brown to white, and becomes, if possible, better tempered and nicer than he was before. As soon as he heard what Wang Chi wanted, he opened two windows at the back of the hut, and told him to look through each of them in turn. "'Tell me what you see,' said the hare going back to the table where he was pounding the drugs. "'I can see a great many houses and people,' said Wang Chi, "'and streets. Why, this is the town I was in yesterday, the one which has taken the place of my old village.' Wang Chi stared, and grew more and more puzzled. Here he was, up in the moon, and yet he could have thrown a stone into the busy street of the Chinese town below his window. How, how does it come here? he stammered at last. Oh, that is my secret, replied the wise old hare. I know how to do a great many things which would surprise you. But the question is, do you want to go back there? Wang Chi shook his head. Then close the window. It is the window of the present and look through the other, which is the window of the past. Wang Chi obeyed, and through this window he saw his own dear little village, and his wife, and Han Chung, and Ho Sin Ko, jumping about her as she hung up the coloured lanterns outside the door. "'Father won't be in time to light them for us after all,' Han Chung was saying. Wang Chi turned and looked eagerly at the white hair. Let me go to them. I have got a bottle of water from the Sky Dragon's mouth, and— That's all right, said the white hare. Give it to me. He opened the bottle, and mixed the contents carefully with a few drops of the elixir of life, which was clear as crystal, 
and of which each drop shone like a diamond as he poured it in. Now drink this, he said to Wang Chi, and it will give you the power of living once more in the past, as you desire. Wang Chi held out his hand and drank every drop. The moment he had done so, the window grew larger, and he saw some steps leading from it down into the village street. Thanking the hare, he rushed through it and ran towards his own house, arriving in time to take from his wife's hand the taper with which she was about to light the red and yellow lanterns which swung over the door. "'What has kept you so long, father? Where have you been?' asked Han Chung, while little Ho Sin Ko wondered why he kissed and embraced them all so eagerly. But Wang Chi did not tell them his adventures just then. Only when darkness fell and the Feast of Lanterns began, he took part in it with a merry heart. End of the Feast of Lanterns Recording by Ruth Golding